Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rido, joined as always by my partner and boxing hall of famer Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how are you? Good. Whose hand is raised behind you? You are the next the next superstar, the next uh you that's, I always learn that, I learn my current events. I learn my you know, my new news by just talking to you and looking behind you. Then I know <laughs> what's going on in the world. For me, that's the next great superstar at welterweight for sure. Virgil Ortiz getting it done against Maurice Hooker. Awesome victory. He looked great. Granted, Maurice Hooker, I wouldn't put him in the elites of the welterweight uh, division, but nevertheless, he's he's a legit fighter. He's been in there with some great guys, and uh, man, Virgil Ortiz looks good. What'd you think? Yeah, he, I listen, he's a good guy to test a, a, a guy that's at that place that Ortiz was at. It's, he's the right guy for the test, and he passed the test. He passed it with flying colors. Um as I always say, most important thing, who owns the geography uh, that best suits their style and abilities? Hooker needed to own the outside. Ortiz needed to be in the front yard and start a barbecue, and he did. <laughs> you know, he um, he got it for the most part. He got it to where he needed it to be, where he eventually was able to use his punching power and his superior physicality. Young kid, uh Ortiz going in there with the more experienced Hooker, whose only loss was by knockout in a title fight, but uh, he was tested, and he had the right answers. He had the right answers. Uh, if Hooker, you know, if he was going to win the fight, he, he would have to use his jab, I thought, and I had talked to somebody from ESPN.com. They called me up before these fights, and they asked me for my my thoughts, and I told him that. He said, what's the X factor? If I remember correctly, I said, it's going to be the body punching and it's going to be the jab. You wouldn't think about the jab with a young power puncher, but to me, that was the most important thing because Hooker, if, I mean, if, if Hooker was going to win a fight, he was going to have to use the jab. He was going to have to stay on the outside and control that area, that geography, if you will. And for me, if Ortiz was going to be more than just a guy swinging from the fences, more than just a guy that's looking for the big punch, he was going to have to use his jab. And he did. He matched Hooker's jab. He used a, a nice, straight, accurate jab, kind of like Tyson, the great puncher used to use uh, when he was Tyson. You know, the jab was very important. George Foreman, when he knocked out, you know, we look at the uppercut and all that stuff, when he knocked out Joe Frazier to win his first title, um, the heavyweight title, but it was the jab that set it up, that discombobulated, that stabilized Frazier. And same thing for Tyson. He was out jabbing taller guys, even though he was the puncher. So he showed he was a complete package for me looking at it through the lens that I look at it, through the trainer's lens, uh, Ortiz, again, did what he needed to do. He needed to come in there, understand what Hooker was going to try to do, own the outside, outbox him, pot shot him. And the first thing you should do is match his jab, and he matched it. He matched it for the most part. Took it away. You know, two ways to take away somebody's jab, Ken. One is to use your own jab. And the other is to counter with right hands if you're fighting an orthodox fighter. To counter with right hands uh, over the jab to make him hesitant. Uh, you know, make him thoughtful about trying to throw the jab where he's, he's you know, he doesn't want it because he's getting counted or he has to worry about getting counted. Uh, Ortiz used the first way. He, he, uh, he took it away with his jab. And again, if he otherwise he's reduced to a bull in a china shop. Otherwise he's just you know, he's just another guy that comes down the pike that's a good puncher and you know sometimes he won't get it done when the punch can't land or when the punch doesn't detonate, when it doesn't get the damage you want it to get done. Then you then you find out what a guy is, you know, mentally, emotionally, character wise, you know, if he falls apart or if, you know, if he just keeps grinding away and staying to the plan. In this case, you got he got tested a little bit mentally, but uh, he also got tested that his technique was was supporting him. That his technique, 
uh, you know, that he has that delivery system for the bombs, uh, that he is more than just a bomber, that he that he can do other things. And he showed that. And then you knew he was going to get to the point where he had to put water in the basement, you know, uh, t- to take away the ability of a guy like Hooker to stay on the outside, use his legs, and, you know, to discourage an older guy, to show an older guy that this young kid on the block is more than just a young, pretty face. And he did that. And he turned it around with the body punching, he, with the water in the basement. He turned it around. Uh, again, I was impressed with what I saw. I liked what I saw. Uh, you know, he, he didn't have to go to the mattresses, so to speak, if we're going to use uh, movie terminology and, you know, stuff like where things get really extreme. You got to go to the mattresses. But he was tested. He was tested, and enough to improve him as a fighter. I don't think he's ready, and some people might get upset, and this isn't a knock on him. I wouldn't put him in with Spence uh, yet. And, you know, they were talking to Spence afterwards, Spence, Crawford. They were all there. Uh, They were showing him an audience. But I would stay away from those guys right now. Spence, I think, uh, you know, this. first of all, he's... He's such a big welterweight. And second of all, being that he's so big, Ortiz is what, 22? He's still filling out. 22, yep, 22. He only has 17 fights. Yeah, let him fill out. Let him fill out. Let him get more seasoning, as you just touched on, Ken. But let him fill out. Let let the physical part grow. Let, Let his body grow a little bit more. Let him get that man body, that man strength. Right now, putting him in with Spence would put a kid in with a man. And and again, it's not a knock. I'm just using that terminology to get the point across, just to get to it real fast. But I think the point that, the, the one that they were really calling for and talking Crawford, about in the ring was Crawford. Yeah, yeah. well, the physical dimensions are different there, but still, let him get more seasoning. You know, you're not dealing with a you're not dealing with a monster truck like you are with Spence. If you go to Spence and he might be too big and too mature right now um, for the kid. Um, but you're dealing with a real mature, real seasoned, real talented fighter in Crawford that can do it all. He can, he can fight in the trenches and he can definitely fight on the outside, use his reach, you know, make you pay for real estate, make you pay a price trying to get in. Uh, I th- I think, I just think right now, let this 22-year-old kid get more fights, get more under his belt. Uh, he's only going to get better. And, you know, just give him, a, give him a couple minutes before you put him in with those two guys. Uh, but having said all that, uh, it's not a knock on him at all. When I say putting a, a kid in with a man, I'm just using that, again, I'm just using that as a visual um, to get to the point. I, we know that he's he's a man. I understand that Ortiz obviously is a man. Um, but he's a young man. And just, you know, just don't be in a rush uh, right now with that. But as far as what took place on Saturday night, uh, I liked it. And, and again, I, I see a mean over my 45 years, a mean punches come down the road. But you want to see the other elements. You want to see, obviously, the fortitude, the mental side. You know, when, when the punch doesn't work, do they wilt? Do they evaporate like a puddle does on a, on a hot July day and it, it just evaporates with the heat? Does that happen when a guy depends on his punch and all of a sudden it's taken away from him? Uh, you know, you want to see that. You want to, you want to see the substance, the mental substance. So you you got to peek at that, and and you, and again, you want to see that the guy is working on all cylinders. You know that that the guy is, you know, he's not a one trick pony. That that he that he can, you know, do the things that we expect guys to do in a boxing match to use the jab to go to the body you know, to control range, to change range, you know, to show those dimensions, not just the power dimension. So I was, I thought he was terrific. Um, he, uh, as I said, he didn't behave only like a good puncher. You know, he, he showed the other assets that he has. Uh, 
I want to just look at my notes. I always take notes. I want to be thorough. I don't want to cheat the people out there. Uh, after you watch the fights, I sit. Look at these notes, Ken. I got, I got twenty, I got twenty pages of notes. I mean, after I watch the fight, I, I want to keep it fresh. So, I, I do my homework. I thought that Ortiz showed class afterwards. I like that. Um, you know, uh, he's a he's a kid, as you said, Ken. There's a reason why he's he made Ken's wall. That's all you need to know. You know, uh, he made Ken's wall. Uh, he's on his way. He's on his way. Oh, buy stock. Oh, oh, buy stock. <laughs> buy stock in Ortiz. Buy stock because he's rising. He's 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 rising. He's going up. He made Ken's wall. I mean, the rest is just a matter of time, you know, uh, before he gets Well, the there. first thing you've got to do to get on the wall is stay busy. One of the biggest takeaways for me of the weekend was Terrence Crawford being interviewed and saying uh, of the Errol Spence fight, yeah, that fight's dead. It's not happening. I've moved on. It's over. I, I, it's, that, to me, is one of the biggest f frustrations with the whole sport. You've got two guys that supposedly want each other. They're at the top of the division. I mean, I get it. There's no crowds, but I mean, how many years are we going to wait for this fight? And and it is getting to the point now where I'm starting to genuinely not care. Next, let's go. Put Virgil. I'd rather see Virgil Ortiz in with one of them at this point. I'm so sick of waiting for them to make this fight. And I get Crawford has problems with top rank, and I think he's probably waiting out the contract now. But what a mess of the welterweight division. I mean, we just can't see the best guys in there with each other. It's it's frustrating. So well, you might, you might not be happens. able to see the best guys in a lot of the divisions, to be quite frank, if you're going to go that far. Fair. I mean, the light heavyweights. Yeah. I'd like to see Bevo and uh, Better Be of. You're not going to see that. Two different promoters. Nah. So, you know. Yep. <clears throat> um, no, you're right. Hey, guys, want to take a quick pause to give thank you for t to today's sponsor, Athletic Greens. Uh, we've been talking about these guys every week. You know I genuinely love them. We reached out to them. I take this stuff every single day. It's an all-in-one daily drink to support better health and peak performance. These guys spent 10 years with top nutritionists and doctors to create this formula. It's made from 75 whole food sourced ingredients. It has vitamins, minerals, prebiotics, probiotics, and antioxidants. Consider it like an insurance policy for your body's health and immunity. And like, again, I know I sound like a broken record, but to me, this is the one supplement that if I could only take one thing every day, it would be this. Because to me, all the vitamins and minerals you need are in most foods. But getting all those vitamins and minerals every single day is, in my opinion, close to impossible. Athletic Greens basically assures that you're ticking all the boxes and making sure you get everything. Um, this stuff combined with uh, Amp Humans Vitamin D uh, plus topical lotion is Get, that's got you covered, especially during the COVID times. You want to have a strong immunity system, and um, Athletic Greens got you covered. Um, Athletic Greens has given our listeners 10 travel packs for free. So um, whether you're looking to boost your energy levels, support your immune system, or address gut health, Athletic Greens is the way to go. Simply visit athleticgreens.com slash atlas, again, slash atlas, A-T-L-A-S, to claim the special offer of 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Once again, athleticgreens.com slash atlas. One of the notes I made to myself, and that's why I do notes, that's why I do notes, because I remember things then. I like this, the cerebral part of Ortiz that he was thinking while he was in there doing what he was doing, obviously looking to, you know, to land his big shots, but he was thinking. And that, and proof of that to me was when he dropped him with the, when he hurt him at the end and finished the fight with the right hand, Ken, you know, he set that up by jabbing low and then he shot high. That's smart. That's smart. That's being calm. That's seeing everything that's there, and and thinking, and that's a future. That's a future, and um, with a guy that can think, as well as have talent. Uh, so that and it opens up a little bit of a question for me to you. Um, what happened? I I don't think they ever explained it thoroughly. Uh, you know, he landed that nice right hand. He set it up with the jab. Gortiz did. And he landed the right hand that basically ended the fight. And I thought the body punching was, was getting us there, you know, when Ortiz started going to the body. Um, but what happened? Because they never explained. The hooker's arm was hurt, his shoulder was hurt, his hand was hurt. Because for me, 
I didn't see anything that would have caused that. I just saw a right hand land on him, on his chin. So did you have any do you have anything to explain with that? Yeah, no, I, after the fight, you know, Hooker was being interviewed and it, it looked clear that he really had an injury because it looks like he threw a hand and then in the inter he threw a punch and in the interview afterwards, they he just kind of glossed over it, but he said, yeah, I threw a punch and my hand popped. I'm assuming he man's broke because he said, I've got a big bulge in my hand, but it definitely looked like he he, he had a legitimate injury. I mean, he was he looked to be in a lot of pain. No, I'm not. I'm not questioning. I'm saying he, I'm not going to question that. Yeah. Either. So I think I think he I think he broke his hand. I just thought, but I thought the right hand landed on him, and that they, I mean, it seemed like simultaneously, he was he was showing pain in his hand as he got hit with the. It just. Confused me. Yeah, it looked bit. like he landed a shot on top of uh, Ortiz's head, maybe, and and he flinched and went down and was clutching his hand. And then in the interview after, he said, "I hit him and something popped in my hand. Maybe he broke his hand." But um, yeah. But he got caught the right hand before that. Oh, for I, sure, for sure. I mean, he, I mean, he was. That's getting, why I was he confused. Was, he was taking punches. He it looked like the beginning of the end. Anyway. Oh yeah, there's no doubt about that. Soon as he mentioned that hand injury in the post-fight interview, the crowd really turned on him and started booing him, um, for better or worse. It was well, that's kind of why I brought it up, just to clarify it, because I, listen, I, I didn't stay with it long enough. I was popping back and forth between boxing and UFC, so I didn't have the luxury to stay with it. That's why I asked you uh, to yeah. track it down, because I popped back to UFC because, you know, I'm... I'm in a Twitter universe over there, Ken, and I was, <laughs> you know, I was moving, moving around a little bit uh, to both to both sides. So I was just, you know, because it was, I I could see where the fans probably, because they probably saw only what I saw. I saw the right hand land. I didn't really see his right hand. That's why I was, you know, getting you to clarify it for me. Yeah. Well. He, cl he claims he, he claims he hurt his hand. Um, looked like he hurt his hand at the point, but um, yeah, I'm sure he did. One of the things that you mentioned there about fights you'd like to see is uh, better Beev and Bevel, and uh, better Beev was in action. We talked about it last week that uh, if you want to see a lion being fed, he's gonna fight um, D Danis, uh, Ger a German kid, I think. Um, and better be of did it, you know, what, what what you would expect of him. He broke him down, took him a little longer than I thought it would. He broke him down over 10 rounds. I mean, at times I thought he looked a little, not, not rusty, but he was certainly taking his time, looked to be getting rounds in. Um, I think, I feel like with better Biev at times, he does do this. He almost fights to the level of the competition and maybe you see it differently. I'm curious to hear your thoughts here because I know he's been dropped by essentially a fighter no one's ever heard of before. Um, but when, if, when, when he's in there tough, he gets tough and he, and he, and he ups his game and um, he hasn't been that active. Curious what you thought about his performance. And do you think he fights to the level? Yeah, I think that's a fair point. I think that's, that's fair. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, I think he, he always has the same mission to, get to, to win, to get the guy and to conquer the guy and to uh, break the guy down. He comes to conquer. Um, he comes to destroy. I, I think at the end of the day, that's his mindset. He, he comes from that kind of background, that kind of upbringing, uh, the region of the world that he comes from, where they, they, they're brought up to be, to have a warrior type mentality. And um, I think that that's always foremost with him. And it's always, you know, it's always, I think, uh, clear that this is a no nonsense guy. And, you know, he's, he's there in that kind of locked in laser beam sort of focus. But being that he's a warrior, being that he's bred to be a warrior, so to speak, uh, with that mentality, warriors, they like challenges. They, they want a challenge. Uh, you know, they want to fight the lions. And, and sometimes I think even if it's subconscious, and that's a good point on your part to, to notice that, I think that if you're giving them something that they deem as less than a lion, um, you know, there's going to be a, a little bit of a subconscious letdown. 
uh, a little bit. I mean, they're still they're still coming prepared. They're still coming to eat, <laughs> and uh, you know they're still coming to to dine on your bones, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> but I, I think that the appetite's not quite at the same level as it is when they feel that they're getting a top top challenge. Like when he was in with my guy, with uh, Volsic. He knew that was going to be a top, top challenge, and and uh, that's exactly what you know he came for, and he and you saw it in his entire approach. But and you saw it the other night. Don't get me wrong, but again, to your point, maybe at a lower gear that it it just uh, again warriors want a challenge. All competitive people do, and. Uh, I think when, again, when he thinks that the challenge might be, they're not people, you know, fighters are smart. They know what they're fighting, that the challenge might be a little less, a little less, not that they take anything for granted. He doesn't, but a little less. I think that uh, it's going to take a few more minutes to, for the gears to click uh, to get to that speed where you're on the highway going 120 miles an hour. So um, I, I, at the end of the day, you know, another mandatory, I have to say it, you know, because we, we give everything to the fans out there. We try to. Uh, another mandatory contender bites the dust. You know, it teaches <laughs> us, I think, that the only thing that should be mandatory in boxing is that you wear a protective cup. <laughs> you know, that might be the one thing that should always be mandatory, I think. Um, and But listen, I always want to be fair and respectful and... Dennis, uh, how do you pronounce his name? Is it Dennis or Dennis? I think it's Dennis. So Dennis. Dennis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Dennis, um, listen, he showed lots of heart and toughness, okay? Uh, Better be if, as we said, he broke him down, he warmed down. Better be if it's the ocean. I mean, he just keeps coming, takes part of the shore with him every time. Uh, you know, he turns the ring into the ocean. Everything in it with him becomes the log. He pushes the log. He pulls the log all night where he wants to until he finally crashes the log against the rocks. Um, very romantic guy, uh, this better be if. Uh, he used his jab well. I was impressed with that. Again, kind of like what I said about Ortiz, Ken. You know, more than just a puncher, more than just a, a monster. You know, a smart monster. Better be if I, I don't know if the commentators were giving him his dues for this because I watched that with with the sound off. To be quite honest, um, you know, this way I'm just concentrating on what I'm seeing and I'm not being influenced by anything else. But uh, I saw him using his jab well. Better be if to control what Dinas uh, did on the outside or tried to do on the outside. So I, I, was, I was very solid to see that. That was part of uh, what he needed to do, fighting a guy that's going to look to box. You got to stabilize him with the jab. And Dinas was a southpaw. And again, something subtle that maybe, I, again, I don't know if the commentators mentioned it, but I was seeing it, where subtly, here's this this... You know, this warrior, this gladiator, this monster, better be of, right, that just keeps going. He knocks everyone out. He keeps going until he dines on your bones, as I said earlier. But he was doing these little smart, subtle things. He knew he had a southpaw, so he was sliding a little bit to his left where he would get better position for his jab, where his left foot would get outside the lead right foot of the southpaw, where he could stay away from the power punch of the southpaw, the backhand, the left hand. And again, he could get better position to score with the jab, which he did. So I was impressed with that. I noticed that. I gave him credit for that. Um, you know, uh, hey, the other thing I think that fits in, Ken, that's interesting to me is better be if he's a tank. You know, he's, he's a tank, right? I mean, he's 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 coming in there. And... Um, He's he's occupying territory when he comes in, right? He's he, he he's like a tank, and he covers up like a tank. 
That's interesting. You know, he, he covers up. That's, his, that's part of his armor. He doesn't move his head a lot. You know, he, he blocks. He, he covers up. And uh, he puts pressure on you. He rolls in like, you know, like a tank. Uh, his concentration, as I touched on earlier, his focus never wavers. That's part of his talent. That's part of what he brings. Calm and steady. Disposition always the same. Stoic. Devoid of expression other than laser determination. Uh, eye on the mission, as I said, to destroy, take over, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to conquer, um, to occupy. Uh, nothing to criticize, obviously. If I said anything at all uh, in a constructive way, it might be that better be of maybe could have went to the body, to your point. You know, taking his time. Maybe he could have started going to the point, Ken, a little earlier. And if he did, I think he probably would have got rid of uh, Dinas a little earlier if he started putting water in the basement just a little earlier. Um, but you know what I love about Better Be of Two? And again, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not just saying he's just a tough guy. I'm pointing out all the other things that he deserves to have pointed out. And um, he throws nice short punches. He really does. Boy, oh boy. You, you, if you like short punching, you got to like him. He gets inside. He throws six-inch, seven-inch punches. Uh, doesn't take up any space at all. Matter of fact, he gets too close sometimes where I think normally for a regular guy, he'd be smothering himself. But for him, he's, he's able to still get the punches off because he throws such short punches. Uh, so I don't, I think those are all interesting points, all points that he deserves to have mentioned that he's more than just a, you know, he's more than just a, a tough, strong, physical guy. He's, he's, he's much more than that. And he showed that. He showed that to me, uh, even though it was a fight that I don't think the outcome was ever in doubt. But still, you're looking at the way a guy does it. You know, I remember when Tyson used to demolish these guys uh, if two things he would say, which was very accurate and very smart. He would say, first of all, if you're going to knock me for getting rid of that guy, first of all, I got, I did what you're supposed to do. If you're the, me and he's him, I did what you're supposed to do with those those kind of guys. And I did it in a smart way. I did it in a boxing way. I did it in a, you know, in an impressive way, in a way that shows my skills. And, there's something to be said about that. Uh, and it's important that a person does whatever their job is in a, obviously in a high level way, uh, showing those abilities. So I want to give him credit for all that. Uh, you know, he, he's the immovable object, Ken. He's the epitome of that, you know, where you, he makes you feel like you can't, you can't stop him. Like he just keeps coming the you know that that unstoppable force that just keeps coming and that wears people down it's the physical part but it's that part too it wears guys down i mean pressure breaks pipes pressure breaks people you know and that's part of his game that relentlessness uh you know where you start to feel like you don't have control like you can't ha have a say about what he's doing of course you do of course you do but he makes you feel, he makes certain people feel at certain levels that you don't have a say, that I'm going to do what I want. And that, you know, you, this is an immovable force or object and force. Uh, so he breaks you physically and mentally. Uh, he breaks your body, erodes your will, takes the oxygen out of the ring. And uh, I would love to see how Canelo would handle that. I really would. I know the first thing fans out there would say is, Teddy, don't forget Canelo's naturally the smaller guy. I get it. I get it. But I also get that Canelo spent a lot of time on the weight program building his body up. He's got a different body now. He doesn't have that small body anymore. So I would just, it would be really interesting, and I thought it would be interesting for the podcast for us to kind of put it out there to the audience, because we have a great audience. Um, wouldn't you like to see that force, everything I just described, that immovable object, that that relentlessness, wouldn't you love to see that against what people are saying is the 
you know, pound for pound number one fight in the world, right? Or some people are saying it's either him, you could take your pick, him, Crawford, you know, there, there's a, in, uh, in, uh, in a way from Japan, there, there's a few of them up there, but he's one of them. Wouldn't you love to see how he would deal with that? I would. Um, you know, so, and listen, I also, uh, I'd like to see better be of with Beevil as I talked about at the beginning. You know, I'd like to see that, but you're not because of the promotion situation in boxing, unfortunately. But uh, I'll finish by saying a note that I made to myself. Better be if it's the ocean and it's always high tide. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> and and it's, uh, it's a question of, can we find somebody who's going to bring in the low tide? Uh, that's it. That's, that's, that's the whole story. Um, uh, if if somebody's gonna beat him, and everybody's beatable, we've we know that if history's taught us anything, but it's gonna be one of two things, Ken. It's either gonna be somebody who has great legs, great jab, uh, great stamina, mentally, great mental endurance, toughness, and great stamina physically that can own the outside, use his legs like a young Lomachenko did to give angles, keep him off balance, and box all night long. Dance all night long, baby. Box all night long, but it, but create enough offense to win the fight, to keep him honest, to make him be a little respectful. So somebody well, we've who... Seen, we, we've seen the game plan of how to beat him. Alex Vosdick was beating him on the scorecards through 10 yeah. rounds no, until, thanks he for caught, saying until he that. caught up to him. So you had the game plan of how to beat him, and I saw you put it into practice for eight straight weeks. So it's just a matter of finding the uh, physical abilities to be able to do what Alex did and the engine to keep going for another you know, six to six to nine minutes. No, you're right. I, listen, I'm, I appreciate you saying that. We had a good game plan, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, you you still got to get to the finish line. We didn't get there, but we we were obviously we we had the right idea. But um, you don't you don't get credit unless you unless you cross that finish line, and that's part of it, and that's part of the skills of the champion that uh, he keeps you from crossing that finish line. Uh, you know, with his abilities uh, and his consistency, but uh, to the most part, but. It's either going to take that, as as we just said, someone boxing, using the jab, controlling the outside, keeping them off balance, and, and being able to, again, have that, that fortitude to keep it up all night long. Or it's going to take somebody who's got to hurt them. It's, it's one or the other. One or the other. Somebody that can hurt them to the body, maybe, to the head, and slow them down, you know, possibly do more than slow him down but definitely slow him down it's going to take one of those two and um so that's what makes it intriguing to throw out canelo can canelo hurt him i don't know if he could outbox him all night on the outside uh, maybe but i don't know but could he hurt him with a body shot could he could he you know put him in his place a little bit that way um and bevo is the guy that has the background amateur wise and pro wise where he would be the next best guy to have a shot to beat him by outboxing him. He's a he's a he's a good solid technical fighter, people, uh, with a lot of amateur background. So that that's the story on Mr. Better Be of uh, who likes to dine on people's bones. I think that after the performance this weekend, I wouldn't say he looked great. I wouldn't be surprised if Canelo gets through Saunders, assuming he can get through Caleb Plant, my newest best friend in Nashville. Um, but if 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 he did, I got to be honest. I mean, better be of 38, 36 years old. However, he's only had 16 pro fights, won them all by knockout. But I don't know. I think if, if better be of were to have another fight against like that against a lesser opponent, I wouldn't be that surprised if in the next, like, 24 36 months canelo was like you know what i've cleaned out if if he were to get through everyone at super middle and say you know what let's do it he's uh, he's the, stepped up for big challenges before yeah this would be bigger though ken this this is a i know i level. agree i agree no, there's a different just, level than those others i i know what you're yeah. saying but this is a different different category 
Um, listen, he doesn't have to. Does he have to? That part of it, does it mean enough for his legacy? Those are all the questions that would provoke the answer. Those are the yeah. questions. You know, yep. does, does for himself internally, for him, because he doesn't have to externally, he doesn't have to do it. Most people think of he's course. great and that's going to be it. But internally, does he have to invoke that challenge? Does he have to find out? You know, um, so, uh, you know, time will tell. Uh, time, I guess time will tell. It usually does. Yeah. So one uh, one quick note before we get to the UFC. Um, Alberto Machado was in action. Um, he's coming off the two knockout losses to Andrew Cancio. Quick reminder, he was 21-0, and 0, went in against Andrew Cancio. Cancio definitely brought in to be an opponent. Cancio upsets him, knocks him out. They schedule the immediate rematch. Andrew knocks him out again. Machado rebounds eventually with a victory um, after the second knockout to Cancio, and he gets a homecoming fight in Puerto Rico against um, Angel Fierro, a uh, young Mexican prospect, definitely brought in this to, to be an opponent in Puerto Rico, Machado's hometown, and um, Machado knocked out again, I think, in the fourth round. But it's just an interesting turn of events for Alberto Machado. It's hard not to feel a little bit, a little sympathy for him. The guy was riding high, 21-0, and and he's lost three of his last four by knockout. I don't know where he goes from here. It's just an interesting turn of events, like you said earlier, almost from the penthouse to the outhouse. I, 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 it's just a crazy turn of events. I mean, the guy was such a hot young prospect, trained by Freddie Roach, you know, had all the hype behind him. I know you didn't get to see the fight, but just curious what you think. Have you, have you, do you remember seeing something like this where someone has so much potential and then loses a couple fights and that's they just can't seem to get a win? Yes. Yeah, it happens. It happens. You know, sometimes one fight could destroy a guy's uh, career, destroy his psyche, his confidence, um, and that's everything. That's your foundation. That's your core. And it can happen, and some fighters never get it back. Some fighters get better. They come back. They, you know, I remember Boom Boom Mancini in the 70s, the 80s, coming up, big uh, star on TV. His first shot was against the great Alexis Aguayo. It was too much. But he, he fought well. He was probably ahead going into the 10th round. But then the championship rounds, and I believe back then it was still 15 rounds. Then the championship rounds, guy like Aguayo took over, and the lack of experience showed. But Mancini. Cini had done himself proud up to that point, but then he got destroyed in the championship rounds. He got knocked out, but then he comes back against Art Freyas. If my memory is serving me right, which is impressing me right now that, that I'm remembering these names that just jumping on my head and I didn't prepare for this. But um, And then he comes back and he wins the title. So he he rebounded. He, you know, he recoup from that it even improved him in some ways because he gained what he gained from going 10 rounds 11 rounds whatever it was 12 rounds with with a great fighter like Oguayo so it, it depends on the person what they're made of uh you know what they are and you don't find out what someone is until you find out what someone is going through something difficult that's when you find out and so it could be only I said earlier Ken that there's two ways to beat better be if either you got to outbox him or you got to hurt him. Well, there's two explanations to this, and I've seen it many times. This phenomena where you got a guy 22 and old, 25 and old, 26 and old, whatever, and all of a sudden, you know, it the air goes out of the balloon. He loses, and um, he's never the same. He gets knocked out. He's never the same. And there's two explanations. One is the one I just touched on, that his confidence never comes back, that, it's, that part of his success was built on his belief, that he was unbeatable. Uh, he was immortal, you know, I'm just saying, you know, just to get the point across, that, that, he, that he, uh, he couldn't be beat. And, and then that's taken away, and, it, and he never is able to, to regain that status, to regain that status within himself, that belief within himself. Um, and then there's another explanation, quite frankly, and I've seen it over the, you know, 25 years almost that I've broadcast in fights at ESPN. And all those years, 18 years in a row, we did Friday night fights, which every week we were doing them. We were even doing Friday and Wednesday nights fights. Uh, so I saw, I, I saw plenty of cases of it. And sometimes, and I would talk about this sometimes, 
it can be that a guy, even though he wins a title, he got built up without fighting really guys that really tested him to the utmost. And he got to the title. Give him credit. Don't get me wrong. He got to the title, but he was never really tested to know what level he truly was. And because they took the easy route. I shouldn't say the easy route, but they navigated a little bit. You know, you you take a you take a route kind of like Jerry Cooney on his way up with Mike Jones, who's a dear friend of mine. They did a great job. Dennis Rappaport, Mike Jones. They called them the Wacko twins. So that that's a different story. But you know, because they they were they were funny guys. They were a little crazy. But they were they were good guys and they, they got him to a ten million dollar fight with Larry Holmes. But on the way up they they had a choice. Take a every once in a while, you're taking a fight that's a ninety ten, a nine, a eighty twenty, a seventy thirty, a sixty forty. What do I mean? Well, you know what I mean. It's ninety percent that he's gonna win, ten percent he could lose, right? Whatever. Ninety nine one, right? We know what that is. And then they because they want to get to that title fight, right? The money, everyone does. Uh, and then. You have a choice. Do I take a 50-50 fight or do I... You don't want to do that. That's poor management. You don't want to blow it. So do I take a 60-40 fight? Do I take a 55-45 fight where my guy's going to be forced to take a deep breath in the fight mentally and physically? My guy's going to be forced to overcome something. My guy's going to be forced to find out something about himself. My guy's going to be forced to put a light in a dark room that was dark before. So when he gets to that dark room in the future, the light is still beyond. See, that's how I look at it. I was brought up that way by Costamato. That's the way I build a fighter. But I get it. I get it. You could do it the other way. And I've done it the other way. I I get it. I'm just saying, you want to get to that place where you're going to get to the title, to the big fight. But along the way, your fighter might need some fights that are going to test them a little bit, that are going to give you some answers. But do you want the answers yet? You don't want them because you don't want to fail getting to that title fight. So here's that's where it's tricky. That's where it's tricky. Because if you don't get those fights, he gets to the title fight. Maybe he gets to it where there's a soft spot, where uh, it's a good spot for him in the title fight. It happens. It happens. You know, you beat a decent guy, not a great guy, and you win the title. Machado, right? Okay, maybe that's the... And you're the world champion. But you still haven't been tested. Even though it sounds crazy to to the public, but you still haven't been tested. You still haven't had that fight to know really what level you really are. And then all of a sudden, your first title defense, you fight a guy named Cancio who has had those tests, who is that next level, who you didn't fight on the way up, and you come up short. So sometimes it's a case that you're just not as good as you thought you are, that that when you finally get to that place where you're fighting better guys now, you find out that you're not quite that level of talent. So it's either that or it's the, the part of, you know, you lose your confidence and... Your sales are down forever. The sales never go back up to catch the wind again. So it's one of those two. And um, it, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. It's a, it's a sad thing. But it, it's part of what you have to think about when you're navigating a fighter's career. When you're bringing a fighter up, you have to think about those things. Now, listen, how do, some guys can leapfrog it, avoid it, because they had such a great amateur career that they have that confidence, they have that experience, they fought the best in the world for 10 years in the amateurs, in the Olympics, in the Pan Am Games, in the World Championship Games, you know, in all those tournaments. Yeah, okay, but not everybody has had that. Um, not everybody has had that. So that that is the reason why you can get that kind of situation uh, where you go from riches to rags um, a reversal of fortunes really, really fast. Well, 
There was, uh, I know you were uh, tweeting up a storm on the UFC uh, fight night, Derek Brunson and uh, Kevin Holland. And uh, before we get to the main event, I know that you had sent out some tweets regarding Adrian Yanez when he was fighting Gustavo Lopez. And um, Yanez, who's a a young up and coming prospect in the UFC, he looked awesome. And you had tweeted some very complimentary things about him during the fight. And one of the um, sports reporters um, read him some of the tweets at the press conference and he was completely enamored. He was uh, very complimentary. He said he was a big fan of yours since he was a little kid. It was just nice to see. You know Teddy Atlas, right? Oh, yes, sir. He is like your new biggest fan, dude. Oh, man, dude, that's actually pretty amazing, man, because uh, I-, I love hearing him in the I love hearing him in the corner. He was with uh, uh, Timothy Bradley going, we're firemen, fucking firemen. Oh, dude, I love that. I love that, man. I, so- I love when he goes out there and... Uh, Talks, so, man. So, so, hey, that's a big, 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 yeah, just, big just, thing to me. Just to read some of his tweets about you, he's tweeted about you a bunch <laughs> watching your fight. He said, you should be called the Terminator, steely cold and calculating, calm in the eye of the storm, make that ice cold. Wow. Yanis gives you nothing but takes everything. I'm a fan. I'm so glad I did not miss seeing Yanis. Special. <laughs> Thank you, man. I, I, uh, that, that's actually pretty badass. Cause I was like, Atlas, dude. And every single time I would walk back to my corner because he said, uh, uh, collected comic collected that's that's every single time i was walking back to my corner i was saying cool comma collected cool comma collected i get to my coach and be like hey i'm not even tired like i'm not breathing hard and so to me like he notices all that that's that that to me that 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 brings joy to that brings joy to my heart man because i'm a big boxing fan and all that so just to hear him just talking about it, that's that's amazing to me i know you got a chance to see that what'd you think of that kid's performance he looked awesome if, if, to me but i'm curious to hear your thoughts i'm a fan of his <laughs> yeah i'm his fan i'm his fan He's got me. He he got me at hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got me, buddy. Um, I I watched an ascending star, um, an arriving star, and Yanez. I was, as I said, I was so so impressed by him. He controls range beautifully. Uh, he's a concise and deadly counterpuncher with a laser right hand. Uh, you got to be mentally that guy to do that. So he's that guy. He um, All grandmothers would love him. You know, the grandmothers <laughs> who always told you don't waste anything at the dinner table. <laughs> you know, eat everything <laughs> on your plate. Yanez wastes nothing. Nothing. All grandmothers would love this kid. I mean, he he uh, he is he is a surgeon in there uh he made me think a little bit of the movie you know me i love to throw those movie clips in there um at you ken and and i know you have a movie studio in your new abode there you know it's uh what's playing in the movie studio uh, this week i'm just curious uh, the kids watched uh, daddy's home one and two this weekend with mark Wahlberg and uh, 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 was Wahlberg there no, he FaceTimed in just to say, oh, guys, enjoy the movie. Oh, uh, your dad's nice. the best. That's nice. <laughs> that's that's really nice. Um, yeah, I was thinking about the movie 300 when I watched uh, Yanis, uh, where the great Leonidas, the, the great warrior uh, in, the, in the movie, where he's talking to his men, to the Spartans, before a battle, and he says to them, we're going to take everything and give them nothing and that's what i thought about with him you know give them nothing and take from them everything that's what yanas does he he doesn't give you much where you can take advantage of and um and he takes everything he again he's a surgeon in there and to be a surgeon you got to have clear vision you got to see everything you got to have you know uh, you got to have nerves of steel ice water in your veins you can't can't shrivel you know tremble it's got to be steady everything's got to be steady you know people think a surgeon you just cut a guy open and you know where things are no you got to be more than that you got to be calm cool and collective you know your hand has to be steady, as I said. And that's this guy. You got to have the mentality to fight the style he fights. To fight that con- kind of controlled style, you got to be controlled. You got you, you to gotta have laser 
concentration and and calmness. And the kid's got it. He's got it. Um I I tweeted along with the tweets you talked about. I tweeted he's like a term terminator, uh Ken. Uh so calm and calculating, steel like cold. And that's that's to me that's what I got I walked away with. Uh as I just said, part of his strength is his disposition that he can employ that kind of style where he's a surgeon operating on you because he's so calm and you know, so calm and disciplined and focused. He's exactly what they mean when you hear that saying, calm in the eye of the storm. That's him. That's him. That's that if you had that definition in Webster's, put a picture of him next to it. Because that's what he displayed. Uh as I said, he impressed me. Boxing or MMA, it doesn't matter. He displayed what I talk about in the sweet science. It doesn't, it, you don't have to be a boxing fan, an MMA fan, or jujitsu. It doesn't matter. If, if you're a fan of combat sports, a fight fan, period, that was the sweet science. That was the sweet science. And um, he controls range. Uh, he he gets what he wants, you know. Really takes a top guy to get what he wants. He gets to fight on his terms. It's it's not as easy done as it. It's not as easy said as it is done. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. it's, it's not. It's not. And he has the abilities to do that. The mental approach and the technical physical approach and he catches you so clean yeah he's a good puncher but anyone's gonna be a effective puncher if they catch it that clean that's part of the trick to catch it that clean and he catches you that clean um again i i love the guy what can i tell you uh, uh he's i'm i'm gonna be watching him i'm gonna be yeah. uh i'll be tuning in he's the kind of guy that you look at your calendar when he fights and you say, what am I doing on that day? Yep. Well, that's a big compliment for uh, for him to get your attention in, uh, in the way that he did. And um, we'll, we'll definitely keep an eye on him. Hopefully he keeps getting the job done. We'd love to talk to him on the show sometime. Uh, on to the main event. Um, Kevin Holland, Derek Brunson, a lot of things I want to get your opinion here on. And one of the things that our producer Rob pointed out to me over the weekend was that Kevin Holland is has the talent to be a superstar. He's a true mixed martial artist, but I almost feel like a big that there's something going on with him emotionally where he is trying to put up this facade like I don't care, I'm clowning around, almost like as and you've talked about this before, as a natural defense mechanism whereas if I if, if he loses it's kind of like, well, everyone knows I really don't care, I'm clowning around. It's like John Jones talking about going out and getting bombed the night before a fight. It's almost like they're building in their own excuse should they have uh should they come up short. But the thing that is perturbing about about um Kevin Holland is that he's so talented if he would drop the like shenanigans and focus on fighting like I, I think that this was a fight he could have won he was probably the better big mixed martial artist in my eyes but Derek Brunson was so good at wrestling and so focused on what he had to do he'd just get him down take him down and out wrestle him but everywhere else I think Kevin probably had an advantage and Anyway, that's a lot, but I, I wanted to get your opinion on a few different topics there because I think there was a lot going on here with Kevin clowning around in the ring and talking to people outside of the ring. I mean, at some point, you're like, dude, you're losing the fight. Cut the crap and like focus on your business. And yeah, I lost mean, to, the fight. to the point that you touched on at the very beginning of that, um, I put a tweet up. I mean, Rob maybe have put it up, uh, but I, I put a tweet up on that. It was one of my longer tweets, so it's it's probably more easily seen on Instagram than it is on the Twitter uh, universe, but it, it was a little longer than most of them because it needed to be longer to explain what I was talking about with what you just touched on with the mental side and a possible explanation for uh, and there being an explanation for a guy behaving that way other than just looking to market himself and looking to also annoy a guy, get under his skin, Ali did it, um, 
So I'll break it all down. I, I'll start with, uh, I, you know, I joke with myself. I was saying I thought only Ali talked during a fight. <laughs> you know, and then I, I saw him. He took it to another level. Um, Holland. First of all, I like the kid. I think he's not a mean-spirited kid. I think from the little bit I know of him and saw him, uh, he's got a nice demeanor. Uh, he's a respectful kid. He's very talented, smart, articulate. Uh, I, I think he knows what he's doing and to the extent that he knows what he's doing. to That part of it's marketing, just like anybody else, whether it's Ali, Conor McGregor, uh, you know, uh, Floyd Mayweather, they all did different things along those lines to market themselves to get bigger paychecks. Uh, it's it's all part of it. But then, of course, it comes down to what do you do? You know, how do you back up those words? How do you back up those shenanigans? How do you back up those those actions, those, you know, that behavior, uh, obviously, at the end of the day? Um, you first you first you get their attention, and then, then you got to show when you get them in the tent, you got to, you got to produce when they come in the tent. You know, you do all that stuff like Barnum and Bailey. You know, you you put all that stuff up outside, you know, with the sword, sword swallower and the flames and everything else. Get them in the tent. And then you better have a good show when you get them in the tent. It's along those lines, you know, right? I mean, <laughs> he he's doing all that stuff to get them in the tent, to get more money, to get their attention. And, and then you got to back it up. Um, we're at that point now. We're at that point now a little bit. Uh, he has backed it up, but uh, you want to see him consistently back it up. And you want to see him back it up on this level that we saw Saturday night. And he wasn't able to, or, or he didn't, at least on that night. Um, and again, I, I, anything I'm about to say is not a knock on him. It's trying to explain something. doesn't mean I'm right, but it means that I've been down this road. I've been down these roads before, so uh, I've seen these things before. I, I noticed, and I'm purely breaking down the fight right now, I noticed that he's a wiry guy. Most wiry guys, in my experience, are good punchers. He's a good puncher. Uh, you know, he gets good leverage in his punches. Uh, built a little bit like Alice, uh, Alessandra. Uh, Alessandra, when, you know, where he's a good puncher. He's wiry too. Uh, this guy, I think, is along those lines. I said, and I always say that fighting is about geography. Who gets the better geography to use their skill sets? And for that part, Brunson got the better geography. You know, he understood that he needed to use his advantage of physical strength and size and force on the floor, on the mat. And he did. And he did, to his credit. Now listen, I also give credit to Holland that he knew his way around the floor pretty good. He knew how to survive it, but he wasn't as good on the floor and as equipped on the floor as Brunson was. Brunson understood that he needed to get to his geography. He did a better job of owning the geography that made sense for him, obviously, than than Holland did. That's, that's number one. Uh... He was able to get on the floor, use that advantage. He survived the knockdown where he got caught a good right hand on the on the whiskers, and he showed a lot of heart. Uh, Brunson surviving that, and you know, and and then getting himself back together. Uh, there was that moment there that the fight could have ended. I mean, Holland came that close, you know, to if he could have caught him another couple clean shots after that. But again, Brunson showed the good set of whiskers, survived it, uh, you know, and then got, again, had his plan, followed his plan, was very disciplined-like about it, and kept the fight in the quarters that it needed to be kept, kept it in the areas that it needed to be kept uh, for him to have an advantage and to stay away from the other guy's uh, strengths from Holland's strengths. Holland was too inconsistent. I mean, if you're going to get give to the simple, you know, explanation, he was too inconsistent. We know that he should have done more punch and less talk, and we understand that. I think we touched that already. Um, but I, uh, I thought that, and I think everybody watching thought the same thing I'm about to say. 
that it was pretty obvious that Holland would have had an advantage if he could have stayed on his feet striking. I felt that there could have been, a, I used the example of Ali talking. Well, to stay with that example, right, that metaphor, I thought there could have been a Zaire moment, a Zaire moment, Ken, like when Ali knocked out Foreman. You know, again, he, you know, Brunson's the bigger guy, he's the physical guy. I thought Holland could have had that moment where he could have maybe caught Brunson a right hand if he could have stayed on his feet striking and what would that have taken that would have taken change in range not allowing Brunson to go for the shoot uh you know keeping keeping using the ring or the octagon uh where he kept the advantage of distance where he could do that he wasn't able to do that he didn't do that in a consistent manner you know that takes in a locked in discipline to do that and and a locked in you know plan uh, that that this is what you're gonna get done, and he didn't he didn't get that done, and and that took away his chances to win a lot of it, because that was his best chance to win. I felt was was in the striking area, and again I give credit to to Brunson for surviving that moment uh, where where he got caught, and I'm gonna go over some of my notes, but I, I'm going to go over what, what you opened it up about because that's what people need to hear and want to hear. We, you said it brilliantly. He's talented. He's so talented. It, it, it confuses people. Like, why is a guy like that, in their mind, waste talent? Now, look, I know he's successful. He's been successful. So he's not a waste of talent. But there's more. There's more. There's more to be gotten there. Even on that night. And we all understand that part of it is entertainment, so he covers that to to get his name, to get himself out there, which he's done. But then you got to produce, like I said, when they get in the tent. And some of that's being stymied. His talking, obviously, it's become a trademark. I mean, was my nephew, Jeff, uh, he's a big UFC He's a good kid, and he's a uh, he's a big UFC fan. So he comes and he he wants to always every time he knows he follows the podcast. So every time he knows that I'm gonna be doing something on UFC, he's like, "Let me tell you about the guys that are fighting tonight because I follow these guys. I'll give you a rundown." You know, he wants to be my scout, which I appreciate very much. <laughs> I, so I love said, it. "Yeah, give me give me give me the scouting report on these guys." So he said, "You know," he said, "Yeah." The, this guy uh Holland you know he he loves to talk you know that that's he loves to talk that's his signature you know that's what he's known for that is trademark but he's talented he's talented one time he was on the floor and he was talking to a guy who was on top of him next thing you know he gets the guy to engage and he catches the guy a shot and he knocks him out and meanwhile the guy's standing over on top of him so I get the visual I say okay this guy's different and um and again, it, it, it has, if my nephew's telling me he's accomplished what he wanted, it has become a trademark for him. And it can be a very nice marketing tool, obviously, right? Um, as I said, like McGregor, Mayweather, you know, Masvidal, Nate Diaz. I mean, they do their share. They do their share. Uh, I think that's fair to bring that all in. But they do the other part, too. You know, there's no inconsistencies in those areas of, you know, when push comes to shove, of backing it up. And um, and you have to back it up. And like I said, Holland has, but not to the level that we think he's capable of. And definitely didn't do it on Saturday night. One other thing that I'll add there, though, unlike Masvidal, Diaz, and McGregor, they're talking, they're telling you, "I'm going to beat the crap out of you." Blah blah blah. But they do but it when they're in the when they're in the ring. They're focused. They're not. There's not as much Diaz. Okay, a little bit of talking. Well, Diaz but he's a little not, bit. Diaz a little bit. But but, but listen, these guys the, are monsters. <laughs> these guys are serious. These guys get the job done. You're right. Right, but not to the extent that Kevin is like clowning around in the corner. He's not listening to his 
coach. He's talking to Khabib. And like you said, I love Kevin Holland. I think he's a great guy. And if I were in his corner, I'd say, listen, I get it. All that stuff is great, but cut the but crap But it's more to it. Fight. But, but Ken, yeah. so you're looking at it, and you're right. You're an intelligent guy. You're a fan. You're looking at it. You're looking at it from the perspective, the only perspective you could look at it, on the outside as uh, as a civilian. And and it makes sense what you're saying. Like, somebody should have a talk to him and, hey, come on, let's get on the same page here. Come on, the window's going to close at some point. Let's get serious yep. here. You're right. You're responsible. You're a father. You're a fan. That's what you would tell your kids. But there's something else going on here. There's something else amiss. And that's what I'm going to touch on now. That I and feel that's what I want. Right, that's what I wanted to hear from yeah, you because I know you have a thought on yeah, this. Yeah, if I'm right, if I'm at. right, he didn't get it done to the level he needed to on Saturday night. And again, if that's going to be a part of your game, then you can't allow it to dominate your game. And it seemed it did on Saturday, as you said very well, talking, 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 showing, whatever. The doing still has to dominate over the talking and any theatrics. Now, before I say this, I want to say I can see what being an MMA expert, I, I, I can see, I, I want people to understand, I am not an MMA expert. I'm a fight expert, but I'm not an MMA expert. But there's parallels. They're cut from the same cloth. In the ways, you know, the technique's different, the rules are different in the ring. You could go to the floor, you could use elbows, you could use knees, you could use kicks. To just so, I get it. Small but gloves. the psyche all, is the same. All that stuff. But the psyche's the same. That the mentality's the same. It has to be the same. There's, the, there's a stringent mentality that they're dealing with the same thing, whether it's kicks, whether it's elbows, whether it's fists. They're dealing with a threat. It's not normal. It's not normal. It's not. Normally, people, human nature gets you through things by helping you survive. Where human nature, it sees a threat, it says, okay, how fast do you run to 40? <laughs> you know, whatever. But, but, I mean, it finds a way for you to survive the threat because that's human nature's job. Human nature's job is not for you to necessarily win or to have a house or a big house like you have or, or, or Ferraris like you have <laughs> or any of that stuff. Human nature cares about one thing. It's subject to human body surviving, living, for that moment, not not even for the day, but for that moment, getting you past moments that could threaten your existence. That's what human nature is about, and as and that's where we're all brothers. You know, people say sometimes, "Oh, we're, we're we're brothers." We are brothers, all of us, no matter what your race, your creed, your religion, you know where you come from. We are brothers in that way. We all cut, we bleed red, and we all come from the same thing, that we're born, we're human. And human nature is in all of us. It's in all of us. It's there for a reason. It's part of our existence. As much as water is part of our existence, and air to breathe is part of our existence, and substance of food is part of our existence, and that's the human nature is part of that existence. And we're all brothers and sisters, all of us, that when it comes down to being threatened, human nature is there. It's there to save us. The only reason you don't walk across a car every damn day, across the street every damn day, and get hit by a car and get killed is because human nature clicks in and says, look, so what am I touching on right now? I'm touching on the four-letter word. Uh, not a dirty word, but some people think it is dirty. But it's the most important word in the world. In my world, and whether you know it or not, in your world. Fear. Fear. 
It's everywhere. It's that I know some people are uncomfortable with it. So you want to call it anxiety? You want to call it butterflies? You want to call it nervousness? All right, go ahead. Be free. Go ahead. Call it that. But it all gets cut from the same place. Fear. You don't cross the street without looking because you're afraid of getting hit. Yeah, you're smart. You're, I get it. But you're afraid of getting hit. Fear. And the people that control fear in this world, whether it's fear emotionally, whether it's fear of stage fright, I don't care what the hell it is. But the people that learn to coexist with that and control that, they're the most successful people in our planet. They are. They are. And that's what fighters have to deal with at a higher level than a civilian, than a normal person at a higher level because it's in your face every day. It's there next to your shoulder to shoulder every freaking day. It's not normal. That's not normal. Not everyone has to deal with that every day. And it's difficult. And human nature is very wise. It's ingenious. It's smart. And again, its job is not to matter if you make a big bankroll, if you drive a fancy car, if you, if you win, it's that you exist. That you, that's its job. That's all it cares about. That's all it cares about. So when it's great, great, when it's great invention called the human being, this great miracle is being threatened, human nature clicks on. It clicks on, goes to work, and it does what it has to do to survive you, physically and emotionally, because we don't only get hurt physically in the world, we get hurt emotionally, sometimes more emotionally than physically, yeah. So you, you have a situation where you're about to face something, Human nature knows that it's threatening. So the first thing it's doing is preparing you. It's got your adrenaline going. It's got, your, it's got you ready. It's got your senses keen. You need fear. Without fear, you wouldn't be that keen. You wouldn't be that alert. You wouldn't be that strong. You wouldn't be that fast. It gets you at the level. DEFCON 4. It gets you ready. But then it's up to you to handle it. It's up to you to control it. It's up to you to tame it. It's up to you to put a saddle on it. Yeah. Yeah, baby. Otherwise, it just completely overtakes you. Fear, like Customato, my great mentor used to say, it's like fire. If it's controlled, it cooks for you. It heats your house. It, it does everything. If it's not controlled, it burns you up and everything around you. It consumes you. One or the other. But it has to be understood. It has to be controlled. I used to talk to the New York Jets when the great Eric Mangini, a brilliant coach, uh, he should have lasted longer as a coach. He should have. He really should have. He was that smart. He didn't get enough time. But he was a coach three years at the Jets, three years with the Browns. And him and Mike Tannenbaum, Tannenbaum a very good general manager, they were running the Jets. And they were... and. Mangini was a fight fan, and he told Tannenbaum, get a hold of Teddy Atlas. Can you get Teddy Atlas? Yeah, what do you want him for? I want to talk about boxing. I want him to talk to our guys because there's a parallel here. He was smart. He said, our guys are in a fight. Yeah, we don't have gloves on, but they're in a fight. They're feeling the same things a fighter feels. Fear! And nobody else really talks about that. It's like, it's taboo. Oh, don't talk about that. It'll make you weak. No, it won't. Talking about an understanding might make you strong, actually. Not understanding it and letting it overwhelm you, that might make you weak. Yeah. Let it play its tricks on you. That might make you weak. So, man, Jeannie, they reached out for me, and they brought me in to talk to the team. The relationship lasted three years. I worked with them. I... I um. And yeah, you wise guys out there, we had a winning year. 
Yeah, you wise guys out there. <laughs> you. Good thing you went back to boxing. You didn't give up your day job. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Well, you probably yeah, would have won right. the division every year if it wasn't for the Patriots. Yeah, well, that didn't help. So, but we had <laughs> we that damn that damn Tom Brady, the son of a. So anyway, <laughs> w- but we had a good. We had a. We we did okay for a couple of years. We did. We had one year where we had a real big winning year. I think it was Mangini's first year where he went ten and six or eleven and five or whatever it was, somewhere in that area. It was a good year. So Mangini did the work, not me, obviously him and Tanner about. But I did my, what I was asked to do. So one time, Ken, they brought me in. They wanted me to do the meeting. Uh, he wanted me to do the morning meeting. So I said, all right, give me all the information that I need. What, what are we coming? Well, it's Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, whatever it was. Tuesday, I think, was the day off, so maybe it was Monday. Whatever it was, early in the week, going over the game, and they missed a lot of tackles. That's all I needed. That's all I needed. I felt like I was Vince Lombardi. Boom! I'm ready to go. <laughs> Miss tackles, I know what to do. So I go into the meeting. You guys missed a lot of tackles. Uh, is that all you got, Coach? Kind of like, kind of like uh, Ali asking Foreman in a fight. Is that all you got? Uh, <laughs> yep. No, I got something else. Why did you miss the tackles? Well, because our head was too low. Most of the time, the head was too low. They missed the tackle. Why? You obviously know the technique. You've been playing football since your peewee. So you have college, high school, peewee, whatever, Pop Warner. Why the hell? So why is your head too low? And then that's where we got really heavy. Because they, they said, Coach, why? Why? I'll tell you why. Because what are you looking to tackle? Probably a 235-pound running back that's got legs like your grandmother's oak table. And bench presses 500 pounds and runs a 4 3 40. Oh my God. I don't want to tackle that either. So, what happens? Your technique, everything, you know what you're supposed to do. And just about when you're about to engage and make that tackle with your head up, everything else, your little friend, human nature, comes along and says, Wait, I got to save your backside. You, you can't be here. Tackling a 235-pound guy that has legs like your grandmother's oak table and bench press at 500 pounds? I got to save you. So for that split second, human nature saves you. Where you put your head down and you don't see what is threatening you. You don't see what is the danger. Human nature did its job. I know you blew it. You're going to get cut, cut. If you keep doing that, you're going to get cut. Right? And human nature ain't cut no checks. I get it. But it did its job. It saved you for that split second because human nature is about split seconds. Split seconds. That split second, that moment, it saved you from facing this danger. If you allow it to, if your discipline is lacking enough where you don't say, no, no, I'm, I'm not sitting in the, in the passenger seat. I'm staying behind the wheel. I'm saying, you can do what you want, Mr. Nature. Have me ready. Have me alert. But I'm driving this freaking car. Not you. That's it. That's it. So, sure enough, I got my point across. That that split second, maybe if you're not disciplined enough, if you're not conscious enough of staying in control, there's a reason why you lose control. There is. It's human nature not to see what's going to hurt you. It's human nature. So you got to be cognizant of that, aware of that. So here, when we go now to the UFC and what we're talking about, my theory is this, Ken, that with all that pressure that fighters face, with the dealing with the fear, and I know that Mr. Holland's a brave son of a gun. He is. He's braver than 99% of the people walking around. Who's going to get into an octagon? Very few people. Very few people. So he's all that. He's all of that. All of that. But he's human. He's human. And as humans, we have our frailties. We have our doubts. We have our spots that are there. 
and we have to deal with it. And here's a guy that when, just because a guy is a fighter, just because a guy is physically equipped as he is and physically talented as he is, doesn't mean that he doesn't have these doubts. And human nature has an answer for you. It does. It does subconsciously, okay, but it does. Where you have doubts, you're not sure of, of yourself as much as you are. So you compensate, you talk, and you, you act like nothing bothers you, and you do the, you know, the macho stuff. And, you do. and listen, it, it's smart, it's his temperament, it's his personality. I get it, I'm with you. It's, uh, it's marketing, it's all that. I get it. But it's also his way of dealing with, you know, it's his personality, his way, like Ali did, of dealing with the doubts, of keeping the dog from, keep the dog at bay from getting to the door. Because that dog of doubt, that dog of doubt is trying to get through the door. And you're trying to keep him at bay. You're trying to keep him the door closed. So here you are, you're, you're acting nonchalant, you're acting, you're doing all this, this stuff, right? The bravado, the, the whole thing, you know? And we just see the showman. And then, but there's something missing. The part that's missing is he's not doing the action part. Ali did it, but he did the action part. He had control over it. This kid has not gone at that part. So my explanation, and I've seen it with fighters, I've been down this road, this is not new to me, is that when he's facing all these things, it's not the physical danger and fear, it's the emotional danger and fear. That if he's not that good, if he's not good enough, if he doesn't win, people can hurt him. They can hurt him more than the fighters with the kicks and with the bare fist knuckles almost and with the elbows. They can hurt him emotionally by saying, you're not good. You're not good enough. You're a failure. You're not at that level. So human nature steps in and gives him the perfect, perfect setup. The perfect out. The perfect out. Says, if you act like you don't care, people can't hurt you if you lose. So now if you lose a fight, it wasn't because you weren't good enough. It was because he didn't care. He didn't care. If he cared, the assumption is he would have won. He could have beat that guy if he cared about it. If he wanted to, he could have. But... He don't care. I had a fighter. I'm not going to get into it. Most people probably understand it. But a great fighter, a fighter that I love. And he was a great fighter. And I've seen other fighters. He wasn't the only one. This is not a solo universe here, guys. There's plenty of, there's, <laughs> there's plenty of room. There's plenty of people in that room. Believe me, it can get crowded. A lot more than you think. A lot more than you think. But he's a guy that I... I, I love to this day. And sometimes he wouldn't train. Sometimes he he would outwardly do as you talked about with John Jones, where he would outwardly go out and party, you know, where everyone would see it. And, and people would say, oh, he don't care. And a lot of people thought, oh, he's lazy. No, he's not lazy. Human nature is brilliant. It was his way of protecting himself. That if I act like I don't care, if I act like I didn't prepare right, if I lose, people will say he only lost because it didn't matter enough to him. And, I, and you can live with that. You can live with that. I know it sounds crazy, but that, in a way, that's a win. Now, people just heard me say that, Teddy, are you out of your mind no, because if that's what you're trying to do to save yourself, to protect yourself from being hurt, from failing, you just won. You just won. 
because you found a way to do it. You found a way to do it, to protect yourself from failing, from not being good enough, from the world being merciless and coming down on you. And that's where I think I would start if I was involved with this kid, and I think he's a good kid. I really do. I like what I saw. I, I would start with that. I would say, and it's deep, but it's not as deep as you think it is. It's really not. It's just that people are not used to hearing this. And I know our, our audience out there, and I love them, they're, 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 they're hearing something they probably haven't heard before. But I guarantee you a lot of them are thinking right now, thinking in their own little thing where these things have occurred to them in their own little fights. Yeah, not with gloves on, not with kicks, not with jujitsu, but in the, in the business world. In a, in a person world, in whatever they do, whether they go into a board meeting, whether they're in the stock market, whether, whether they're uh, whatever, whether they're a nurse, a doctor, a lawyer, in a courtroom that you got to face, you know, that opponent, uh, that threat, that fear, you know? How many times, I'm talking to you right now, the audience, straight on, straight on. How many times have you been some years before uh, a test? That's scary. A test. Everything, all that work you put in in college comes down to a damn test. A damn test. What if I have a bad day? And before the test, what do you do? Maybe you don't study as much. Yeah, Listen, if you made it, you studied because you made yourself. But is there a feeling to not study? To not pick up that book? Is that laziness or is that human nature telling you to avoid what's scaring you? Avoid what's threatening you? Avoid what's coming down the pipe? That's what it is. I guarantee you. Yeah, there's lazy people. Okay, we'll throw that in there. But for a lot of them, and somebody goes out and they have a drink. And they really shouldn't be having a drink or maybe two drinks or maybe three or four or five. Definitely shouldn't be having three or four or five uh, before the test. Why? Is that because they're an alcoholic? Is that because uh, <laughs> they're, just, they're, they're just a party maniac? Mm, no. No, it might just be because, again, it's a way of avoiding what's coming down that pike, what's banging at that door. But the, the winners, they fight it off. They fight it off. They stay, they keep their hands on that steering wheel. They don't sit in the seat next to them. They don't become a passenger because that's what human nature is trying to do. It's trying to make you a passenger. Let me handle this. Let me take this around the curve. <laughs> let me, I got you. I got you. Let me, let me take this around the track a little bit here. No, you want to take it around the track. And I think that there's a chance that's going on with Holland, that, that, that there's a degree of that subconsciously that is going on. That if I act like I don't care, you know, because it's gone past the point of just entertaining. It's gone to the point where now it's hurting him. It's hurting his performance, as you said, Ken. It's taken away from getting the win. It's, it's taken away from getting the job done at the end of the day. It's, it's chipping away at that. And... I think a part of it is very, very likely and possible that it's become a protective device where he might not even be fully aware of it, where it's easier to have an excuse to lose if, if he loses. Now, look, if he would have caught the guy and the guy didn't get up, you see that right hand, Ken, that he caught him with and he dropped him? Now, if he doesn't get up, okay, okay. Okay, baby. He did enough to give himself a chance to win. He 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 didn't go completely south. But the doubts, the shadows, the ninjas that come over the wall, come over the wall to all of us. We're human. We're human. They come over. This gives this gives us an opportunity to allow us an out. That, okay, if he does get up, and then I don't have the confidence. Really, he doesn't really have it. The true confidence 
Just because he talks don't mean he's fully confident. The full confidence, the full belief, the full all-in discipline to continue doing what I have to do to get him on the floor again. Now, if I come up short, oh, see, I dropped him when I felt like it, and then I fooled around a little bit, and, you know, it's it's implied. He doesn't have to say it. He's a gracious guy. He's a smart guy. He's a classy guy. I like his I like him, his character. He doesn't have to say it. It speaks for itself. We're saying it. People are saying it. Oh, he clowns around too much. If he didn't clown around so much, he would have beat that guy. He dropped him. He would have beat the guy. He's talented. Oh, my God. He's so talented. Oh, my God. He could be. It's your out. It's your out. Again, it's very complex. But for me, it's very simple. I hope I explained it right. Yeah, no, you definitely did. And I think that most people listening to that, if you take away the fighting aspect of it, there's a lot of uh, elements there to apply to your everyday life about fear and about having a I could care less attitude. Um, I was talking to a psychologist friend recently and we were talking about you and he was talking about all of your um, analogies with regards to fear. And he said there's two key components to that 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 uh, differences from humans from other animals that that differentiate us. And he said the two things that control everything are our um, vivid memories and our wild sense of imagination. And those two components of our brain affect everything that we do. Memories of what happened the last time we were in this position and our imagination of what could happen usually for the worst when we're in this situation again. The imagination is always worse than the reality. Always, always. But I talk about this all the time. I live this. This is my life. I mean, sitting in the locker room before fight, Ken, to the point of the psychologist, he's, he's right. But sitting, I practice this. I practice this. Sitting in the locker room, Ken, before a fight, it's the hardest part. It's the hardest part. I, because the I'm imagination can attack you. If you're not steadfast, if you're not secured, if you're not strong, if you're not fortified, if you're not ready, if you're not experienced, if you're not all those things that you need to be steeled, forged, need to be, your imagination could destroy you right there. Right there. Because here's the way, this is my way, my layman's way though in a layman's way where it's easy to explain that i explain it to fighters i explain it to people that i talk to whether it's the new york jets football team or, or whoever asked me to talk to them to help them in those areas is there is a limit to the physical things that can happen to us there's a limit there's a limit on whatever we do in the courtroom, what we do in the, in the, as a doctor, what we do as a fighter, as a ball player on the field, in the basketball, on the baseball diamond, in the football field where my son works with the Raiders, with all those things. There's a limit on what can happen. The, 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 physically, we've been there. Most of it we've seen already. And it, it can only be what it can be. But there's no limit on what the imagination can bring us to. There's no roof on that. There's no ceiling on that. There is no limit on where our imagination can take us. That's the problem. That's the problem. Because our imagination can take us, as the word suggests, to imaginable places. To places that don't exist. But they exist in our mind. And that's enough. That's enough to destroy us. That's enough to take all the physical work we did, all the talent that we were born with, that we developed, that we formed, all the planning and technique, and flush it down the toilet bowl. That's the key. That's why I always say in boxing, 75% of it is mental. It's the same thing in life. In most things in life, if there's a challenge, if there's a confrontation, if there's a fear factor, if there's a contention factor, if there's something that you have to deal with to overcome, to resist, if there's any of those components in anything you do in life, and most things in life there are, especially important things, substantial things, most things are. 
If you're a teacher, you got to deal with the fear of being, dealing with the, the pupils. You have to deal with that fear of not being good enough, of not being properly uh, accepted or listened to. Or, you know, uh, you have to deal with that. that that's a fear. That's, that's a component of it. It's not just taking what you wrote and reading it to the classroom. No, it's dealing with that obstinate child that there's always going to be something to overcome. There's always going to be resistance in something you do if it's worthwhile. Always something to overcome. And that's where it, that's where it, it takes what I'm talking about. That's where the imagination has to be kept in its place. But it has to be understood that it can get out of place. It has to be understood that it can become a tidal wave that drowns you. It has to be understood. It has to be recognized. And it has to be controlled. But that is what we're talking about. These are the things that are at, at foot, if you will. These are the things, subliminal things, the, the underneath things that separate us from success and failure. When you're talented enough to succeed every time, every time, every freaking time, but you don't. And most of the time, it's because of these things we're talking about. Yep. Well, that was an uh, awesome explanation as to what could be going on with Kevin. Thanks for that. Let's talk about some heavyweight action this weekend coming up. We've got boxing and UFC. Let's, uh, before we jump into a quick shout out to my bookie, check them out at mybookie.ag. Use the promo code Atlas and they'll give you 100% credit on your first deposit up to $1,000, so you deposit $1,000, they will match you $1,000, so you'll have two grand to play with. Uh, some good action coming up. Let's start with the boxing first. We got Dillian White and uh, Alexander Povetkin, part two. Interestingly enough, Teddy, the fights in Gibraltar, uh, the only country in the world where they have 100% of their population vaccinated. Interesting side note. But um, rematch of this fight, the odds here, Povetkin is at plus 265 coming off of the vicious knockout win. Oh, well, wait, let me just fight. jump in. Like, when you brought up that, that, that number, which I'm glad you did, the 100% vaccine, um, everything attaches to money. Everything attaches to business. So I'm saying, I'm guessing that's why it's there, so they can have a big crowd. Am I correct? I, I would assume so. Uh, it would seem, otherwise it would seem, um, co very coincidental. I don't recall a fight, big fight like this happening in Gibraltar, but I know Dillian White spent some time training in Portugal, maybe in Spain, so they're not too far off there. But um, odds for the fight on my bookie, um, plus 265 on Pavetkin. White is minus 330 over under seven and a half rounds. I forget what the, what the odds were on the first fight, but... Uh, Dillian White had the fight well in control. I think he might have had him down. I'm I'm spacing on this. I should have researched this before the show, but I think he had he might have had uh, Pavetkin down. It looked like it was the beginning of the end, nevertheless. And Pavetkin, the wily veteran, caught him with a beautiful uppercut, knocked him out cold. Dillian White demanded an immediate rematch, which he's getting. Uh, I'm curious to get well, your Pavekin's thoughts here. Well, getting paid for it. You know, I mean, of course. Oh, 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 uh, no, oh, but I'm course. just saying, of course, for Pavekin, it made sense because White's people need to to undo what was done. They have to 100%. undo what was done if they're gonna if they're ever gonna get to you know to that Joshua or Fury fight ever, or, or to get yeah. to where they could call themselves some kind of cockamamie the title holder or what is the uh, interim champion you know there's yeah. so many belts out there how many belts you got in your closet i'm just curious none that matter you know, because uh, well they're all the same i just put them out there put them out there i'll call you a <laughs> belt holder no really hey eh? you're a belt we'll holder. make up our own. i mean believe me whatever amount you have can they're not as many as these organizations have. I mean, we should they, start awarding they got our own silver, belts. they got copper, they got tinsel, they got aluminum foil, they got they got uh, gold, they got the, oh my God, Pearl. almighty. Pearl. 
pearl, the right. Aztec belt. That's uh, nice. Fans That's out nice. there, Aztec. please start a petition that you want the uh, the fight with Teddy Alice to start a alligator ring magazine. Get, get him we'll an alligator. Ken would look beautiful in alligator. <laughs> alligator or ostrich. You know what? Uh, now we're gonna get. Uh, yeah, it really it would. And and then I get. I'll buy the boots to match. I'll buy the boots to match. Let me ask you this. What if we oh, say... We're going to get Petter. Uh, I know what's coming next. Petter, Petter's going to call up Rob and say, you know, you guys, uh, Teddy Teddy shouldn't be talking about ostriches being worn as belts and and and, and alligators, you know? I mean, really, we, we don't want to do that. So I hope Petter, I hope Petter's not upset. I'm, I'm, I'm not killing alligators. What if instead of a belt, we start awarding like suspenders, like, it's, you know, like uh, it's, it's as arbitrary as a belt, like we'll give you a suspender. So when you win, you get the suspenders, they say what it is, I or, like or it. maybe like a headband or a I hat. like it. I like it. I like it. And uh, so, hey, if, if people want it, let's get a petition going. We'll start awarding each each weight division who we think is the rightful king of the division. But anyway, I digress. <clears throat> Tell me, what should we look for here? Because I think that there's a lot of psychological elements to this fight with the rematch. All you need to do is look at the line. Yeah. Really. There's a, uh, he knocks the guy cold, and he's a huge underdog again. That's all you got to do. Look at the well, line. I think because he had him, fr from, from, from Dillian White's perspective, he thinks he had him. He had it well in hand, and, and Pavetkin got lucky. But you don't get lucky in a head. Like, that's... No, he took advantage of a vulnerability. First of all, Pavekka did what he did in a high-level way. And number two, he took advantage of a vulnerability or flaw in White. White's been hurt in a lot of fights, but he survived them to his credit. A lot of heart, a lot of, lot of guile, uh, a lot of instinct. He's a big guy. Give him a lot of credit. He had a lot of kickboxing fights, so that helped. But he didn't have any amateur fights, maybe about 10 or 9 or 8, whatever. So give him a lot of credit. A lot of credit. Um, and But he'd been hurt a lot of times, or a few times, I should say, and he survived it. He survived it. This time he didn't. So it was always there to be done. It was always there to happen. And like I used to say to fighters, Cuts made me this way, but he said that's why you're going to be a good trainer. I, I used to say to fighters, they win a fight, right? Same thing as White. He win all his fights, most of his fights. He win a fight, and then everyone loves to hear the positive. Oh, okay, I won the fight. And the first thing I'd say, but you did this wrong. And a lot of guys don't like to hear that. A lot of, guys, a lot of trainers won't even go there. Like, what do you mean? I, I won the fight. I know you won the fight. I get it congratulations but you still did something wrong that another fighter might take advantage of there's somebody better somebody that that will take advantage of that so you so even though you won you have to correct you have to look at what 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 needs to be looked at that was still wrong it get washed away it gets covered because you won it gets hidden from criticism because you won but the truth is, you still did something wrong. You better correct it because somebody else there will take advantage. And that was the case of White. He had been doing things wrong. He'd been getting hurt. Nothing got corrected. The truth is the truth. He got hurt. He, got, he showed heart. He showed all. He big guy, good puncher. All those things. I, I, I like the guy a lot. A lot. But, and, and we helped him. We helped him on this show where, where they, they attacked him, the organizations, where they didn't give him as mandatory, where they kept him, they kept him as a mandatory for I, I, 20 years where he was supposed <laughs> to fight, right, within you know 90 days or whatever the mandatory was, and they never gave it to him. And then when they talked about the, with the other stuff, that we went to bat for him. We, we, we believed in him, and we went out there to our audience and 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 said such uh, to him, for him, you know, that give him a shot. To stop this, this keeping him, you know, keeping him from getting his chance for the title. But the truth with that is that while he was winning those fights and he was taking chances, he was staying active, and I give him credit for that too. He didn't just sit back. He was trying to get better. But while he was doing that, he was hurting a couple of those fights and nobody corrected it because you won. Nobody, or maybe they didn't know how to correct it, whatever. But it didn't get corrected. It didn't get corrected. 
And then he paid the ultimate price. They thought they'd get away with it because they're fighting a 40-something-year-old guy. But the guy was a former champion. I trained him, of course. I We won a, his, we won a title in Germany when, when I trained him. But he is a good puncher, tough guy, Pavekin, and experience, obviously. And maybe he took for granted, you know, he had hurt him in the fight. He got a little bit. He had him down. It was Teddy. He had him down twice in the fourth round. He really started to take over. And in the fifth, he was. Hey, listen, he had him hurt. He got careless. He got that was all part of it. That was all part of it, no doubt about it. You know, going into the fight, they they figured, yeah, the guy's this, but he is forty and you know, we're handling, we're handling. But they still had that flaw where they were getting caught clean punches regularly. And they didn't correct that. They didn't see that. They didn't understand that. Hopefully they understand it now. But the reason why he's a big favorite is what you said. He was this close to knocking him out. And the guy's older now. Perfectin's 43 years old. How old is he now? 42, 43? I mean, he's he's up there. So he he's only getting older. Perfectin's not going to get better. White, the younger guy, you would think is going to get better. He's going to learn from that. He's going to tighten up some things if he's got the people around him that can... You know, that know how to teach, that know how to tighten those things. I don't know if he does, but... Pavetkin's 41. All right, he's 41 years old. So he ain't getting better. You know, I know old wines get better. I know. You he's have a wine almost, cellar. He's got you could tell me about the old wines. But I, I know uh, you got that raw child. Yeah, he's also got 39 fights, uh, 36, 2, and 1. He's been knocked out once. Yeah, so again, he... The line is with White, who got not cold, and I mean cold, cold. Um, he's a favorite because he had Pavekin down. Pavekin's older now; he's a year older, or whatever, or whatever it is. But he's older now. Again, Pavekin, even though wines get better, and some fighters do, but at forty-one, Pavekin, that was as good as he's going to be. He's not gonna. He's he's not gonna be bad. So and those vulnerabilities that he showed are probably still gonna be there, where he could be hurt, where he could be caught by the taller guy on the outside. You know, he could be vulnerable to certain things. Those are still gonna be there. Now they're just bargaining the 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 people in Vegas, the people that you know, my bookie, everybody that puts these lines out. They're bargaining, and of course, white people. They're bargaining that he's gonna close the show this time. That, that, you know, he's going to do the same things he did last time, only he's not going to do, you know, he's not going to leave the door open uh, for Pavekin to do what he did. Um, so I kind of agree with the lines. I think White's going to, I think White's going to win this time. I think that the guy's older, Pavekin, he's a, he's an old warrior, he's an old war horse, but he is, he is at that place where you, you can't forget what you saw when he was in the ring last he was hurt. He was on the floor. He showed all the heart in the world. That's what he does. But he was hurt. He looked like a shop-worn guy. He looked like a guy at the end of his ropes, a, a guy at the end of his career, quite frankly. And unfortunately, he looked like a guy that usually those former champs that stay that long, that's how they go out. With a younger guy, a strong guy, that's how they go out. But he threw a wrinkle. He threw a wrench into the... Uh, he, he sure did. He threw a monkey wrench in there, and, and he wasn't ready to go. He caught this guy yep. because the guy made himself available, as I said, because the guy still had flaws that weren't corrected, and, and he took advantage of it, and he did it under extreme circumstances. Uh, he had to get his backside up off the floor to do it at 40 years old. So all the credit in the world to him. But, you know, I believe that you're going you're gonna to go back to that, to be honest. Those things aren't going to disappear. Those things aren't. He's still going to be vulnerable. He's still going to be able to get hurt. And he's even older now. He's even older now. And he's even made more money now, if that, if that works into it a little bit. So, you know, and he's only there for the fight because he's getting paid really good. Okay. So I, I'm not saying he's going to cooperate. Pavetkin has too much character for that. He's going to come prepared. He's going to come and behave like a champion. But he's going to be that guy that was there in the last fight that was vulnerable earlier, that that's going to get hurt. The only difference is this time, I think White is going to close the show and wind up stopping him. Uh, maybe, 
Maybe there'd be a little trepidation early f- from White, so it'll let it go a little longer because he's coming off a knockout loss. Maybe there'd be a little trepidation early. I was going to say he's going to stop him in about four rounds, but um, maybe he'll be a little more careful, and because of that, it'll go six or seven. But I think at the end of the day, uh, White White winds up stopping, you know, a very... Uh, you got to give credit to Pavelka. He's had a terrific career. Yeah. I would also not be surprised if Dillian White wants to... So desperately wants to right this wrong if he comes out aggressive. Not necessarily reckless, but I wouldn't be surprised if he came out and just was like, I got to get this over with. I, like, he so desperately wants to avenge. Well, I'll but tell anyway, you one thing. On that point, Ken, I'll tell you where you're right. This is where I'm going to... I'm going to take what you said and I'm going to adjust it a little bit. If he hurts him, he's going to be aggressive. He's going to get rid of him. The last time when he hurt him, he let him survive a little bit. Yes. He, yep. he let him survive yep. a little. This time, I think you're right. I think in that way, in that way, that I don't know if he'll be aggressive early. I think early on he'll be cautiously aggressive, if that makes sense. You know, he'll be looking to be the boss and looking to hurt him, but, but in a cautious way because of what happened and knowing that he should... He should be aware of that, knowing that he should be respectful of that. But uh, at the end of the day, when he does get him hurt, rather than be uh, taking his time the way he did, I think he'll try to do it the right way, don't get me wrong, but yeah. I think he'll look to uh, to slam the door closed. Yep. Well, uh, once again, the line over at my bookie, minus 265 on um, Dillian White, plus 330 on, uh, sorry, minus 330 on White, plus 265 on Pavetkin. And that brings us to the last topic for today, Teddy. UFC 260, Stipe Miocic versus Francis Ngannou. Hard to root against either guy here. Both world-class human beings. Stipe, a full-time firefighter in Cleveland. Uh, Francis, uh, immigrant from Cameroon, lived in a parking lot in France when he was learning to box. Just like, just an awesome story of perseverance. Both world-class guys, like I said. Odds on this fight over at my bookie. Steep, almost even. Steep a minus 105. Francis, a slight favorite at minus 125. Over under one and a half rounds. Um, what are you looking for in this one? Uh, two classy guys. Two, two, you know, two guys that you, that you said you root for. Francis has been on our show. I've worked in a gym with Francis in Las Vegas in his gym one time and did a, a training session with him. So obviously we'll hope we hope we have good wishes for him. Uh, we respect both guys. I know I do. I know you do. Uh, respect both guys very much. They do it the right way in, in the ring and outside the ring, uh, in the octagon, outside the octagon. Uh, but we, uh, my heart will be with Francis. Um, and I, the first fight, uh, Francis got dom- dominated, friend or no friend. We we always had to tell the truth here. It was a dominant performance and win for Miocic. Uh to to handicap it for me doing my work and you know understanding what these guys possess, what what makes them what they are. Miocic is a much more as I talk about in boxing a lot of times. It gives him a big advantage. Uh, He's the much more dimensional guy, the much more well-rounded guy, the much more experienced guy. Let's be honest. I mean, uh, and then Ganyu started later in his life. Uh, he didn't have to. Exp- he doesn't have the experience that Miocic, uh has. You know, Miocic, uh has has experience both in on the floor and wrestling, grappling, uh, in all those ways. And you know, he was a wrestler. Uh, I believe he was a collegiate wrestler. Uh, I believe he was a Golden Glove champion. Uh, also, Miocic. So he's a rounded guy. The son of a gun is an experienced guy uh, from the amateurs. As I said, he's he's verse. He's well versed in all the deployments of of fighting when it comes to what goes on in the octagon. Could do it. He's just. He's much more polished in those areas than Ngannou. Ngannou has one X factor. 
he can knock your lights out. He can <laughs> he can knock your lights out. I mean, he, as I always would say on ESPN, punches are not made; they're born. That's Engano. That's him. That's him. Either you're born with that kind of power, like Tyson was. Yeah, you could teach, you could improve, you could technique. The delivery system has to be improved to get it across to the target. No doubt about that. To make it effective, but the power, the pure power, it's there from birth, being born a punch or it's not. He was born to punch, and but his delivery system wasn't good enough. His technique wasn't good enough uh, to win the first time. He wasn't experienced enough. I think the moment got him. He ran out of petrol fast. I believe this time two things. I believe he's going to be in better shape, Carter Vasco physically, but I believe that mentally part of getting tired the first time you fight for a title can be because you're burning fuel too fast. You're not used to that moment. You're just not used to being under the lights on a stage for a title. It's quite a moment. It can be an overwhelming moment. And I think that he wasn't ready for that moment. He wasn't, obviously, had nothing that prepared him for that moment. He didn't have that kind of experience, Francis. And I think a combination, he could have maybe been in better physical shape, but I think that moment, not being used to what that was going to feel like, deteriorated him physically. And and as I said, he wasn't able to physically be where he needed to be to to have a better chance on the striking end. Now, also, Miocic, to his credit, he got it inside, he shot at him, he got him on the floor where he could dominate, being a better guy, the more experienced guy on the floor. He was able to do that. And he was able to survive when he was on his feet because of his boxing experience. Survive getting caught with that huge, huge, clean punch that, that I don't care what kind of chin you have. If Nganyu catches you clean, you're getting hurt. You're getting hurt. And um, so, and Ganyu is more experienced now. He, it's three years later. He's more seasoned. In all those areas I just pointed out, he's better in those areas. He's going to be more used to the lights, more used to that stage. I don't think he's going to burn up too fast. And I think his conditioning is going to be better, obviously. But most importantly, his mind's going to be better that he's been there before and he knows what to expect. It's kind of like going to the Super Bowl. You, you got a veteran team and you got a new team coming in and you always hear it. You always hear the veteran team say, well, how's it help you being that you've been to a Super Bowl? Well, we know what to expect. We know what it feels like. We know what the distractions are. We know what can get to you. You know, and the other team doesn't. So he knows now. He's been there. That's going to be beneficial. I think that's going to help in Ganyu. He's had four more fights since then. I think he's better technically. I think he's, he's, he's improved in certain areas. Is he at the level of improvement of technique and being diversified and, and dimensional as Miocic? No. He'd have to fight another five years to do that. No, he, he, he hasn't caught up in those areas. Miocic has that experience in those areas, and he doesn't. And he has that development in those areas. He doesn't. So Miocic is still the more rounded guy. The more developed guy in those areas. But again, I hearken back to the X Factor. He's got that one thing, the eraser. The eraser. That can, that can make up for mistakes. That can make up for experience. In a hurry. In a hurry. So I think he's going to have to use his, I think, I think Francis is going to have to show that he's more seasoned, more controlled, technically a little better, better shape mentally and physically where he sustains himself. He's going to have to avoid the shoots, keep it, keep it on the feet. If I was giving him a little suggestion, I'd say maybe you... You be prepared for a shoot. Maybe you set a trap for an uppercut where you could catch him coming in with an uppercut. There was a UFC fighter. Was who was it? Just recently, Derek that, Lewis. There it is, Ken. There it is. You know that that did that beautifully. It was no accident. He knew he knew that Blades was gonna 
come in looking to shoot because Blades was the better wrestler. So he was prepared to catch him when he shot, kind of like Masvidal uh, caught Askren with the knee because he knew that he'd be looking to shoot and he timed it. But well, same thing, you know, part of success is preparation. Knowing what you're dealing with, being prepared for what you're dealing with. So Francis needs to be prepared for that and have an answer for that. Uh, Miorczyk, obviously, I'm sure he will. He knows what the danger is. He knows exactly what it is. Um, I I think, again, that if they can get to the floor, if they can get to the mat, then Miorczyk's going to win. If he can consistently get to the floor, he's going to win. If he can get there without getting caught to get there, he's going to win. Um, if he can avoid the big shots, obviously, uh, he's going to want to get it into deeper waters. But... I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with Francis. I'm gonna pick him for the people out there. My bookie. I'm not saying you know go crazy, but I I don't like I don't like having to lay the, you know again. Yeah, but it's not a lot. You don't have to lay much. It's, it's what is it again, Ken? My, minus one twenty five on um, Francis. Minus one oh five on. Stipe. Now again, after everything I said, you're probably looking, hey, wait a minute, the dog looks like a good bet here. And I get it. And a lot of people are going to bet that dog. And I wouldn't disagree with you. I would not disagree with you. He's the more experienced guy. He won the first time. He's more versatile. He's just more developed in all the areas of, of combat fighting, quite frankly. He just doesn't have that eraser. But he's got everything else. I'm going to bet on the eraser. I'm going to bet that somewhere along the line, Francis is going to catch him. That's what I'm betting on. And and again, I I, I could see why you would want to take me all trick. I can. I can. A hundred percent. But I'm going to say that me is 38 years old. He's, you know, as much as I think four fights in three years has helped. Uh, Francis get more seasoning get more developed I think it's possible that it could hurt Miocic he's gotten a little older uh, he's had some tough fights with DC got knocked out uh, during that time period that he you know between the first fight and now with, with, uh, with Francis he got knocked out by DC he had three fights with DC they were all tough fights that takes something out of you especially at 38. So I'm putting all that, I'm factoring all of that in when I'm handicapping this. And I'm going to say with all of that, having said all of that, and with Nganyu being fresher, yeah, I know he's greener, I get it, but he's younger. He's been there now. I'm going to say he's going to, I'm going to say he's going to find a way to land that big eraser to erase all the other things that in one instant suddenly they don't matter because he catches them with that big punch. All right. Well, there you have it. Check it out. My bookie.ag. Use the promo code Atlas for 100% credit. The one thing I'll add to that, um, and I wanted to get your opinion, is I do think that both guys knowing that there's the eraser there. Francis, I don't think, is going to go out there looking to lunge and, and take chances early. He I better love not. The over he better this. not. I, I love the over in this fight. Over one and a half rounds. Um, I, I mean, you know, with that, with that eraser, obviously anything can happen if he lands one big punch. But both guys are going to be aware of that. Stipe is going to be on his P's and Q's looking for the takedowns. I just think that they, they ease into this. Francis does have a tendency at times to ease into the fight be a little tentative at times. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, one yeah, side but having note. said that, Ken, having said that, yeah. Francis is known for coming out hot too. He mm -hmm. comes out hot. That son of a gun. Yeah. He comes out of that. He, 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 comes, he comes out of that starter's gate hot. And, and yeah. um, he has, and he's scored a lot of, uh, a few early knockouts because of that. He came out hot against Stipe the first time. He came out hot. And he came close to landing. And listen, to your point, he's he's learned from that, 
and he's you would think that he's going to be a little bit more controlled, uh, a little bit you know more patient, if you will. Um, you would think so. You would definitely think so. Uh, but that power, you never know when it's going to explode. But I, I, I'm with you with the with the over under. I, I would tend to go the, the direction you're going. I, if, if I, if I had to go one way or the other, I would tend to go that way too. Um, one other thing for for the fans out there, special um, special opportunity to hear to get some awesome swag from um, Francis Ngannou. We've got a pair of Everlast fight gloves, and these aren't like the crap novelty gloves. These are like professional fight gloves, like the the real deal, ten ounce gloves. They're beautiful. I mean, I think the gloves are three hundred dollars just for the pair. We've got two gloves, a pair, both signed by Francis Ngannou. We're going to be giving them away to fans. Um, no catch, no no ask. Um, go to the fight uh, with Teddy Atlas Instagram handle. The handle is at the fight WTA, which obviously stands for the fight with Teddy Atlas on Instagram. We're going to have all the information there for the contest of how we're going to give the gloves away. But uh, I'm sure this is going to be a big attraction and... Um, as an aside, I wouldn't be surprised if Francis wins this fight if at some point we see Francis calling out the boxing heavyweight champion of the world. Just my um, just my suspicion. So interesting fight. Awesome opportunity to get some Francis Ngannou um, autograph memorabilia here. Um, so again, check it out on Instagram, the f- at the fight, WTA, the fight with Teddy Atlas, Instagram handle, and... Um, get all the details on how we're going to give those gloves away. And uh, Teddy, with that, that was a long one, but we covered a lot of good stuff here and uh, hope everyone enjoyed the show. Once again, please uh, leave a review, leave a comment, like the like the show, share the links. We appreciate all the support and um, thanks for being with us. <laughs> <laughs>